So I was up very early this morning <clears throat> working on these again, and um, Acquia very kindly changed the official uh, slide template for the company last Friday. So I was, um, my first point was, hey, in a lot of halls that I present in, thin dark text on a white background doesn't do so well. Um, so if someone could do me a favor and tweet me in my company t-shirt in front of the company template um, so that I can find that on Twitter in a few minutes, that would be super helpful. Um, and good morning, thank you, thank you for getting up. I, I, end up, I end up at a lot of conferences and um, you know, doing the DrupalCon pre-note. Who's been to a pre-note, by the way, at a DrupalCon? Aha, uh -huh, awesome. Yeah, so I end up doing a lot of the really early slots, so thank you for getting up and, um, and coming, to, uh, coming to talk about this, wow. Okay, so if you can read this, um, I have a cool title, I like it at work, it's um, Evangelist Developer Relations. And um, the one thing I'd like to ask you today, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what I do and what I do um, out when I'm not talking to, you know, the real hardcore developers, how I kind of try to translate what we do so that other people will buy our services and use our software and help us out. Um, there, is a, there is a Google survey, it's very exhaustive, it's one question. Um, if you could fill that out at the end of my presentation, it would, I would also be really, really grateful for that. Um, there's a QR code coming later for that. We'll see if that's readable. Uh, last night, Florian Loretan um, asked me, hey, uh, so, you know, how you doing? How's it going? What is it, that you, what is it that you do when you're not doing keynotes? And I thought that that would be a, a good way to get the morning started. Um, when I'm not speaking at conferences, um, I've, 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 there have been a lot of fun, interesting things lately. Uh, a guy called Greg Marshall just wrote a book about Drupal 8 views and asked me to write the foreword for it, um, which, which, was a, which was a great privilege. I, since the beginning of the year at the Acquia Developer Center, um, we've had this series on called Drupal 8 Module of the Week. And I've done about 20 or 22 of these so far. And this is a really perfect example of, of what I love to do. My job in developer relations at Acquia is to try and connect you with information that makes your day better. You know, hey, this person's got this project, this person wrote that book, this whatever it is, here, let's build a tutorial how to use, you know, how to use this distribution or, or what have you. And, um, the idea of making this module of the week series was Drupal 8's out, adoption is a little slow, maybe. Why don't we show everyone what Drupal 8 can do now? So I've had the chance to talk with a whole bunch of module maintainers about um, something cool that they built, like rules or like big pipe or like, you know, um, alternative menus, uh, that sort of thing. And, and then together with them, create these posts that, that, that I've, They've been doing pretty well, and I've just expanded this series. Uh, this week I published one about the lightning distribution, um, and in the coming weeks I'm gonna do the open church distribution, Panoply, um, the ad minimal theme, the Drupal bootstrap theme, and then a bunch more modules. So I've been really, really enjoying that, and hopefully, you know, connecting people with more information about what we do and what our system can do. Um, and if you've got a cool Drupal 8 module, by the way, Come and talk to me about it. Let's see if we could maybe turn it into a post. I'd love to do that. I also do the Acquia podcast. Wow, okay, we can't see that on the screen at all. Um, and just about every week, I publish a conversation with someone. Um, these are two guys who run a podcast in, in India from a company called Accelerant. Um, with Michal Schmidt, we did a sort of exhaustive rundown of what happened in the Drupal Association community election, um, talk with Wim Lears about Big Pipe, talk with someone about, uh, actually I love this story, there's a woman called Laura Carriker at Acquia and she joined in the sales department and she decided that to sell Drupal better, she should learn more about Drupal. Now, that sounds obvious to us, right? But how many, have, how many of you have, have met salespeople who really 
are that diligent and uh, about, about no, right? So <laughs> Laura ended up going through the Acquia U training program and fell in love with Drupal so much. She's, she's now a, a, a junior architect at Acquia. And it's just, it's like, it's a really, it's a really cool story. So I love finding those kind of stories and talking about it in the podcast. And then <clears throat> I also get to do fun, fun stuff like work with Angie Byron to write this thing we called the ultimate guide to Drupal 8 um, when we revised it for Drupal 8.1. So that's out there as a resource as well. And, and so what I'm, on the one hand, I'm trying to help you and our community sell the product of all the years of effort that, that we've put into Drupal. Um, and however, I'm, you know, the marketing guy standing in front of the most hardcore developer event of the year. So um, I hope I get it right enough for you this morning, and to some degree, this, this will, I'll, I'll try and extract out of this presentation um, and do it a little bit differently than I'd do it if I were standing at a business or at a university or talking with government people about how they might use Drupal. Um, and part of the intent of this presentation is, hey, let's look at Drupal through a very, very different lens from the one that we're using otherwise this week. Um, so this is not wow, look what I can do with dependency injection. Look how um, you know, the entity system in Drupal 8 makes it possible for us to do all this new stuff without contributed modules. Look how we write this code. It's um, the value, the business value that you've generated by building Drupal, by helping out, by being part of this community. And this business value is actually what people who buy our services care about, right? They don't care about the stuff that we think is fun and interesting. Um, so this is just an example of a technology that's technically amazing but provides an amazing business value. It's a, it's a quick big pipe demo. I'll talk about it just a little bit in a, in, in a while. I'd like to say, right, and I don't want this to sound corny, but um, you developers, you, the developer part of our community, you are actually what makes my work awesome, right? Getting to work with Wim and Fabian Franz um, to, to tell the world about Big Pipe Module, um, for example, to, to, to get to know so many of you, um, and, and then taking what you've built and explaining it to other people and getting our salaries paid, getting our software adopted. Um, it's a real privilege, so thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for getting up this morning, and, and thanks for coming to see this. We're all here, right, because Drupal 7 was a huge success, yeah? It powers a, a significant part of the internet, and um, we're very, a very, very dominant technology across a bunch of verticals, a bunch of industries, media and publishing, NGOs, governments, education, and so on. Um, Drupal's all over the web, and you know we get to build huge, exciting projects. So on the one hand, we can already say, when we're trying to sell Drupal, we can say, look, this is tried and tested and true, and there's an enormous amount of business value in the fact that you know, hundreds of universities have standardized it, standardized on it, and Stanford uses it, and there are huge communities of practice in the government world. There are government distributions that cover security and accessibility and all the things that you're concerned about. There are pre-existing solutions that will get you where you need to be much faster because we are so successful already. And then I love, to t I love to talk about this. If you're a, you know, if you're a, if you're a one person shop, if you're a 10 person shop, um, when you sell someone a Drupal project, you sell them your work, you, you, you have to establish some trust, and, and so you need to share some information that hopefully, you know, helps build a relationship with them. You get to say, hey, hire me, right? But that's what 10% of our developer community looks like. That was DrupalCon Austin, um, and, and that's me, and you know, that's about maybe 3,000 people in the room, right? Hey, that's 10% of the people that work with me. That's, that's pretty impressive, and there's a lot of, um, um, there's an important point to be made when you say, hey, 
if you choose me to implement this technology for you, uh, I really appreciate it and it's going to be great. But if our relationship sours, there are all these people in the world who are still going to be able to work with you and still going to be able to help you out. So Drupal passes uh, what we call the truck test. You know, if something goes wrong, uh, there are going to be other people to help you. So there's, there's, there's huge value in that. Um, there's still a, a great number of, of examples of, of Drupal 7 success on the web, and Drupal 7 is still an absolutely great technology, even though we're all f focusing forward now. But um, who remembers about a year ago, who remembers what it felt like to be in Drupal? Or, or who, was, who was at DrupalCon Barcelona? Right, and, and it was just so full of energy and we were so excited and I was going to pitch meetings in Germany where we were trying to sell Drupal to, to a, a, a magazine publisher and we did the whole, you know, everything we like to talk about. And, and they're like, yeah, but Drupal 8 doesn't exist. How do we know it's going to succeed? How, you, you know, all the stuff you've shown us, that's Drupal 7. They're like, no, 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 this is going to be the greatest. And they're like, eh, come back when it's the greatest, right? And uh, with, a, with a five, you know, five plus years working on this thing, it, I, you know, could have f fallen for believing that it was, you know, vaporware at some point. We got it out. Ha, huh, fantastic. Um, so, <laughs> yes, and everyone who had anything to do with that, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, we're in a really, really different place now, okay? But, hmm, Drupal 8 was five years in the development. Are we releasing the technology of five years ago today? Are we even relevant? Do, do we have any chance with this thing? Well, that's actually what I want to talk with, about, with you about today. I believe very much that the foundations that were laid five, six, seven years ago and the result that we have in our hands today is very much the right set of technologies at the right time and it's also been built in such a way that we are going to be able to stay relevant and innovate for a long time to come. So I want to talk about roughly 10 functional areas, technology parts of Drupal 8 that are new. Let's assume that Drupal 8 does everything that Drupal 7 can, because that is roughly true. And then I want to talk through these areas and address a tiny bit about what the technology is and trying to uh, give you a sense of value that can be delivered. It might be value to your Drupal shop and your developers. It might be value to um, clients and features that make projects better. It might be features that make projects easier to deliver, cheaper, faster, what have you. Always looking for a business value in this thing. And what I realized this morning, what I don't have for these 10 areas is some sort of a table or a chart that says, um, you know, roughly functional area, audience, benefit, and I think, um, in my sprint time this afternoon, um, I might go and build that and add this and, and publish that at some point. So, check out this thing that, uh, that Angie and I did. It's, uh, it's cool. Now, hey Gabor, stop me. Um, I don't know, I was gonna say stop me if I get this wrong. <laughs> but, um, yeah, oh, you know what, Evo this morning asked me if I was nervous about, about keynoting, and I, I, I guess you were joking, but um, you're my toughest crowd, so like I said before, I hope I get this right enough, and if you, ha um, if you have constructive criticism, please come and talk with me, I'll be here all weekend. <laughs> Look, so, language support, hey presto, um, D7 took a lot of work to make really, uh, international, multilingual, localized sites of all flavors. There were a lot of moving parts. It was really, really, really hard. Um, you'd need 20, 30 modules to get everything in place that you needed, and it was never really fully, completely translatable, and all the different systems were built by different people with very good intentions, but they didn't necessarily work perfectly well together. And um, so you had this situation where, uh, you know, n content translation was only for nodes, right? And then uh, 
entity translation was for um, other bits of content that weren't called content, and then you needed the title module as well, and then you needed all these different pieces, and it was, it was just a total pain in the ass, okay? When you live in a country like Switzerland, like Belgium, like India, um, and many, many other places, it's a part of your daily life that you have to deliver multilingual sites. And uh, with Drupal 8 being completely translatable, localizable, uh, out of the box with four modules, right? We are delivering an amazing amount of power, and I really, really think that this feature alone, combined with the other things that we can do, this feature alone um, is going to give us years of opportunities and, and years of, of terrific um, possibilities to work in places like India where uh, there are 22 official languages. Um, and when I say so if we go back a second, right, Drupal 8 is multilingual right out of the box. Is that going to play? It's not going to play. Oh. So basically, with, with your first or second click, you can go away from English, and you never have to look at English again in your Drupal website. And English has no special status anymore. It is itself also fully uh, you know, translatable and customizable. And, um, Oh, there it goes. Right, and um, yes. So that's awesome. So English has no special status. You get to use these four um, discrete modules to create any multilingual model that uh, you can think of, essentially, or certainly than any of the edge, edge case that Gabor and his people could think of. <clears throat> so. Um, and interestingly, uh, uh, g going beyond Drupal 7, uh, things like views, content types, fields, uh, user roles, menu names, block titles, everything is truly completely translatable. So that's huge. Thank you, Gabor, and everyone else who touched that. Um, mobile first, mobile first. Um, I remember when Dries talked about the uh, Drupal 8 in, I guess it was DrupalCon Denver? maybe one before that, and, and talking about the mobile first initiative and, you know, back five, six, seven years ago, we did not have these pocket supercomputers like we do now. The iPhone was just emerging, things were just getting started, and the, and the idea, I remember doing presentations not very long ago where we would say, by 2017, 35% of people will be on the mobile internet, you know, according to the analysts. And now we know that 85% of more of all internet access comes from these devices. So, Dries was really visionary. We got really lucky. Um, you know, we have a, um, a, uh, a mobile first CMS now. So, it is optimized for mobile out of the box. Um, and for example, by, and another great theme in uh, Drupal 8 is we have uh, uh, open sourced our open source project to some degree. We've thrown out a lot of things that we used to take care of ourselves and let other technologies help us out. By adopting HTML5 as our standard output, we get a bunch of really, really cool stuff for free that also helps us then in the mobile world, like um, built-in audio and video playback, and offline caching, and um, browser comp cross compatibility, which is much, much easier. And we get to serve, you know, themes and images and everything with nice breakpoints and that work across viewports and that do, you know, really, really nice stuff. Whoever had to uh, edit some content or do some quick site administration in Drupal 7 on a, a phone smaller than the i6, iPhone 6 Plus. Whoever worked on their site, Drupal 7 site on their phone. How, how much fun was that? Not so much fun? No, no. Like a lot of pinching and dragging and squeezing, and it was horrible. Um, so now we get, some, we get some really, really fun stuff with D8. And this is really fun to show people um, who publish anything, right? When you're trying to sell them a website build and you're saying, you know, look, and if, 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 if something changes or it's the middle of the night or you have to get to your site, look, um, the, the full editing experience is still available on your device and um, things that are words on the big screen become logos on, on, the, uh, on the small screen and uh, we have this um, 
um, these tables where you can define a priority level of a column. So you can tell the, uh, the interface which columns of the table should remain and which should disappear as the, as the width of the viewport uh, changes. That's fantastic. Um, and, you know, they get this for free just by choosing Drupal 8. You can, you know, you don't have to do any work to give people this great mobile experience out of the box. And um, here's a tiny pitch for something that I think is one of the hugest aspects of of Drupal 8, and I think it is going to get better. Miro, are you in the room this morning? Miro, Michalitska. Oh, hey, good morning. So I was talking with Miro a couple of weeks ago um, about, about uh, Drupal 8 being restful, right? And I have this conceptual model in my mind that it is a user interface for building digital businesses, right? You have a user interface that allows you Right? As soon as you've built a view and you check one checkbox, that view is a REST endpoint. Okay? So you can build a Drupal that has no visual front end that's not on the web, but it is a data service or ingesting data and managing it, right? It's content management, and then spitting out whatever you can create as a web service. So this is also amazing for mobile devices because we can do things like, hey, we're going to build one Drupal instance and it is simultaneously going to be the, it is going to be your canonical data source, right? That's important for legal compliance. If you have, if you have pharmaceuticals, if you sell alcohol, whatever it is, there's a lot of laws around what you have to have, what information you have to have available. So you have it in one place, legal signed off on it, approved it, and then you publish it to, an, to a native app right, in whatever kind of native app you want. And you have it on the website, and you can use it to power whatever else you want, but it's in a single place. Our friends at Pantheon showed us some models of what it looks like um, when we can use Drupal uh, a as an API, as a, as a web service. Um, Campbell Vertesi and I built a, uh, a conceptual model when we were talking at a Symphony conference last year, um, where this idea where there's Drupal doing content manager, what it's good at, but it's outsourcing everything else that, um, you know, that you want. And like, you want to write a cool Symphony custom application? That's cool. Symphony has a wrapper for us. You know, that works fine. And you can output it to your, your super hip, um, you know, Angular front end to your native app, but your administrators only have to work in one place. They get one interface that they learn. And by the way, in Drupal 8, you can make it awesome. Awesome. and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they get to take care of stuff in one place. It still goes to a website. The sales team can still deal with, hey, cool. Okay, my battery's dying here. Um, your sales team can still do sales team things, um, and Drupal 8 can sit in the middle of that. It's, it's, it's really, really um, incredibly exciting. If you do work at all for government or organizations that take government funding, like NGOs, like universities, accessibility becomes a huge issue. In most countries, there are very stringent laws about um, the accessibility of government or government-funded web properties, and there are uh, an estimated, uh, you know, almost 300 million people online who are visually impaired. I, um, I, um, Unpleasantly, uh, I'm a musician by training and education, and uh, uh, unpleasantly, I'm, I'm losing some of my hearing, and it's really, really uncomfortable. Uh, the web is still okay for me, um, but it's given me some extra, I don't know, some extra emotional connection to this, this, this problem. And we had, a, we had a system already in Drupal 7 that was great for accessibility. Who ever met a guy called Vincenzo Rubano? Vincenzo Rubano is a young Italian guy. Uh, he helps out in the accessibility issue queues. He's been hanging around Drupal. Um, um, he chose Drupal because Drupal 7 was so amazingly accessible, and we've gone and taken everything up a notch in Drupal 8. This Why Aria markup helps um, alternate browsers know exactly how the page is built, um, and, and all these other aspects are great for accessibility. There's, there's this one point, though, Okay, it's great. There's a lot of business value in being able to sell more projects, right? Government projects, what, what have you. Um, but these alternate browsers need highly structured, clearly structured data to work very well. So when you're selling a system that does that out of the box already, like Drupal 8, 
The side benefit is that this structured data is incredibly good for search engine optimization. If you're publishing good content regularly in Drupal 8, the search engines are automatically going to love you more. Um, and there, uh, that's when a lot of people's you know, ears prick up and they get excited about it. Drupal's kind of sort of specialized in big, complicated, important sites, along with being good for a lot of other things. And um, if you're going to build a site of any consequence, right, if it's going to get a lot of traffic, or you sure, you know, hope it will, uh, you need to believe in the scalability and the, and the speed of the technology uh, that you are offering. And Drupal 8, uh, through the last few years, um, th there was a lot of talk about how slow it was and how poorly it was benchmarking. Um, some of that criticism, I think, was unfair, but Drupal's not a speed demon. We're bootstrapping a whole lot of stuff when we, when we, when we run Drupal. Um, but I think, that, I think that some of the things that Drupal 8 does end up simply obviating that problem. <clears throat> Most people's experience of, of any given website is actually determined um, by how well the website can cache stuff. Yeah? And uh, I, I hope you know that we have an incredible caching, precise caching system in Drupal 8, um, you know, especially thanks to Fabian Franz and Wim, um, but also to a whole lot of other people. We have these cache tags in the system so that when a one element on your page um, is now old and needs to be thrown out in Drupal 7, what would have happened? Page cache out, generate a new cache for everything on the page. It's expensive. It is um, not refined at all. It, it helps, of course, but in Drupal 8, a cache tag will be invalidated and that specific content will be recached. But everything else that doesn't need to be regenerated won't be. So that's huge. So that means we're sending a lot fewer calls back to the server to get stuff so people experience your site faster. Your site, um, in, a, in, an, in an interesting side aspect of this, uh, Wim also talks about the, one of the great contributions that we can make to the environment, to um, helping fight global warming, for example, is to make more efficient CMSs. So if we're making less calls to the server and the server has less work to do um, flushing cache and regenerating, we're saving some energy along the way. And I think that's a really, really interesting aspect. Um, I don't know how much difference it'll make, but um, th th there's got to be something, right? So we cache a whole lot better than Drupal 7 ever did. Um, because of HTML5, we get to offload a bunch of stuff into your user's browser, so also fewer server calls happening, and a bunch of stuff can simply happen on, on my computer here, which, which is um, by its nature also probably faster. Um, and because we're compatible with up-to-date versions of PHP, right, um, look, at the, look at the PHP that we were compatible with in our old versions. Um, you know, 5.2, 5.3. Um, now when we get up to PHP uh, 5.6 and PHP 7, um, you know, we're getting enormous performance gains in Drupal 8 for free simply by, simply by uh, keeping up with up-to-date technology, simply by working with PHP um, like, like, like we should. So that also makes us more performant. And then, so... Okay, so my, my, maybe my second favorite thing in Drupal 8 after the fact that views have, can all be REST endpoints um, is this thing called BigPipe. And so BigPipe, uh, uh, Wim Leers worked as, a, as an intern at Facebook and has ended up since his undergrad days working on performance and caching. Um, and so, so this is really, really cool when you're, when, when you're selling Drupal. Um, in any given cache state, with big pipe off or with big pipe on, your page load time is the same, okay? But if you're talking about user experience, you're talking about bounce rates, when people want to see your site, what they want to read is the article that they found in Google or that they read about on Reddit or something. And they want to see, so they want to see articles and images. And big pipe delivers that stuff cached, okay? So, back up one step. Drupal 8 has these cache tags. It knows not only 
what content is invalidated and needs to be regenerated in cache. It also knows, <clears throat> um, essentially that means it knows what is static and what is dynamic. So when I click on my site that has big pipe, I see the article and the image that I want to see immediately and everything else that's dynamic. So um, what's my friends that's doing? Do I have the right to comment on this? No, that's all bootstrapping. Drupal checking my, checking my user ID and, and my roles and permissions and so on. Um, Drupal 7 would pull up all the content, bootstrap, check all of my roles and permissions, figure out my friends list, do all that stuff, and then serve me the page in one go in, um, what was the example here, six seconds or something. Big Pipe is serving me the same page in six seconds, but I'm already reading my article now in a quarter of a second. Then it's figured out that I can do comments. Then it's figured out what my friends are doing. Um, but all I actually cared about was that. So there's a huge, 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 huge gain in um, user experience there. Really? 10 minutes? We said until 10.30. Uh, okay, okay, all right. All right, okay. Man, they're tough here. <laughs> So Big Pipe gives us this huge um, advantage. And then there's this even newer project, which is even more exciting, called Refreshless. Who's heard of that? Yeah, so because, haha. -ha. So because Drupal 8 has this really granular set of cache tags and knows what's up to date, um, uh, they're figuring out that um, if you're on the same Drupal site and you click to a different page on the same Drupal site, the site can now know what the two pages have in common and not even reload that. So that's even fewer trips to the server and an even faster page load for everything that's left. Amazing. I'm really in love with this. Um, going to try and move a little quicker. Uh, we've outsourced uh, and open sourced a lot of our open source projects. Um, shout out to Larry Garfield. We went from a not invented here, we don't want it kind of mentality to a proudly invented elsewhere mentality because who doesn't like pie? Uh, I did a presentation at DrupalCon Mumbai with Campbell Vertesi about the PHP FIG organization and the PSR standards, and I'm mentioning it um, only because I wanted to put this slide back in. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, so we threw out um, the, 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 the most dangerous and most untestable function that we had in Drupal 7 and replaced it with two Symfony components, the HTTP Foundation and the HTTP Kernel and the Guzzle library. We gained larger community. We gained more eyes on our code. We became relevant for the rest of PHP and we have more collaborators. We have the possibility to hire more developers. These are all um, huge amounts of value that Drupal 8 is delivering simply because we caught up with the rest of PHP because we're compatible with PHP. Um, I talked with my friend Chris Jolly when I met him in December 2013 and I said, Drupal 8 is doing all this stuff. And Chris said, oh, well, I'm a Symfony developer and that's what I'm here at the Drupal Camp Vienna to figure out, like, if it's really true what you people have been saying. And um, then I ran into Chris uh, in August at, uh, or September at DrupalCon Amsterdam. So. Uh, nine months later, which was enough time to conceive and give birth to Chris's first client project in Drupal 8, which was already working um, and had a really, really cool integration between two custom, sim let's see, a, a Symphony OS 2 auth app coordinating two Oxide um, e-commerce instances and a Drupal 8 front end. Amazing, right? So, so, um, Right, and Chris didn't do Drupal before we had that conversation. So, so there's this, there's this huge, there's just so much fruit that this, um, the, the fact that we've opened this up gives us. It gives us so much access to, to incredible ways of working. Um, our theming layer, if you have a Drupal shop, you can now safely outsource a lot more of your theming because your themer cannot generate the white screen of death. Your themer cannot um, touch the database layer with Twig, right? So, so there's a, and plus, um, if you want to hire people to make your Drupal site look beautiful, Twig is the, literally the theming layer for more than 100 other open source projects. It's incredibly standard technology now, and it's maintained by the same people who maintain Symfony. So um, having Twig in the theming layer is, it delivers a huge amount of business value, and if you can read, you cannot read that at all. Um, the syntax is really simple. <laughs> 
Um, and you can mix together HTML5 tags with, with um, you know, printing something and putting logic in, and it's great. I'm um, skipping that slide. Hey, so. Look, we have dramatic improvements, and this is for the people who live in the back end of the stuff that we build, and there's been a terrible problem, and, and I'm guilty of it just as much as anybody, of like, we put a site together, we build it, and we throw it over the wall, we hand it off to the client, we say, click here, click here, click here, good, and have a nice day, and it's not always a great experience, and in Drupal 7 and below, it was k kind of a huge amount of work to change the back end, right? Um, and so, there are two things, there are two or three things here. We worked with the people who make CK Editor to really, really super tightly integrate it into Drupal. Um, and as you saw just before, we can customize the CK Editor and everything that's customizable about it is still tightly integrated with Drupal 8. So, you know, the picture upload button is integrated with our image styles and it's also Im integrated with our um, permission system. The data is still sanitized. It's all very, very, very Drupal. Um, we have also introduced this concept of inline editing, which people out in the real world really, really love. If you see a mistake anywhere in any display of your content, you click this quick edit button and you fix it and it's fixed everywhere, right? It doesn't matter if it's in a blocker of view or wherever it is, you just do it. And um, there was one other point that I wanted to mention about this. Let's see, there are our image styles. Oh, well, Frankly, um, speaking of the people who live in our sites every day, um, now that we have views in core, let's see. So when I do this for other rooms, there are potentially people who've never heard of views. We all know views, right? And we can all build views, right? Well, that's cool. And then this is fun, though, when I'm, when I'm talking with people like, because then I can give the shoe example about like, you know, you can find all these different kinds of shoes and these are fun pictures and you make some jokes. But then you can say, uh, there. Look, so this is this tool that allows me to, to, to find any kind of content on, based on an enormous number of criteria and then mash it up and display it however I need to. Right, and this is like the this is the killer app after our community. This is the killer app. This is the thing that really set us apart, starting with late Drupal four, and then certainly with Drupal five. Um, and now we have this REST API endpoint that's so cool. So I'm I'm skipping over views. Um, views gets a lot more love when I'm talking with people about you know the potential that it delivers for client projects. Um, but speaking of this uh, admin authoring experience, right? Uh, one of the things that, that, that we did when we built Drupal 8, we, we, did, we took this eating our own dog food to, to um, a much further degree than we have before, and we were able to throw out a ton of boilerplate code by making our own administrative backend a set of views. To a large degree, it's just a bunch of views. So if you know how to make a view and customize a view, you can make custom backends for your users. You can simplify things, you can add images, you can change the order, you can make them sortable. Everything you can do with a view, you can do with the back end of Drupal 8 now. So you can deliver fantastic experiences for the people who use them and really, really give them exactly the sort of thing that they need to make uh, their employees, their colleagues, whatever it is, um, really, really empowered to get things done. That's huge. Um, so you can deliver people um, really, really great experiences to get their job done and, and, you know, be happier and more productive. And there's obviously an awful lot of advantage in this. Um, so configuration management, um, which, which I love that people are still calling CMI by accident because of, it was the configuration management initiative for so many years. Configuration management gives us this incredible power to coordinate our developer teams and to merge our workflows and, and, and work better as devs and then, um, you know, however it is that we're working, um, I like to explain how we split content and, and configuration out of the database that we keep configuration in. Um, text files now, and that means that we can version control them, import, export, and so on. Um, this is really, really great for your dev shop if you're considering adopting Drupal. This is really, really great. Um, I'm going to strongly assume that you all already are into this and know, uh, know this. Um, talking about 
how that works at a very high level and how the system gives you nice diffs so you can see the changes and obviously like stage entire sites now. People really, really love that. There's a ton of value in that, um, especially the um, places with, with legal constraints. Um, and um, if you care about that, that aspect at all, I, I encourage you to get involved in the workflow initiative that Dick Olson is running. Um, they're trying to um, integrate this stuff with um, all of the stuff that we've been doing with Workbench and so on with, with um, uh, permission and approval workflows for content as well and get that into Drupal, maybe Drupal 8.2. Um, for us geeks, Everything is entities and fields now in Drupal 8, so we can really, really model absolutely any kind of uh, large structure and get semantic data in fields around it. So, um, you know, I can have an entity that's a party and I can have fields that are then, you know, guests and the dates and the location and a rating and an address and whatever. And all of that stuff, then, if I'm displaying it on a website, all that stuff is actually semantic data. And um, comments are now fields, and all fields are also entities. So I can put comments on users, or ratings on users, or ratings on comments. For example, I could put comments on comments if I wanted to, but the flexibility of being able to field anything and then reference any other entity within the system gives us huge ability to model any data that we want to. Um, and I didn't really know where to put it in the presentation, but I want to give a huge shout out to the concept of block types that we have now. So just like we've had content types all these years, we now have block types, which are reusable templates for blocks. And blocks themselves are reusable, so you can have a contact page, for example, but then also display the contact form in a block on other pages if you want to. Hey presto, amazing. I could have used that several years ago. Um, so, and we have all these great semantic field types in the system, and one consequence of that is the fact that when you're on mobile devices, um, they will then give you the native widgets to deal with that kind of data. Is it a phone number? Then I have the phone dialer. Is it an email field? Then I get email validation along the way for free. Five minutes. Um, oh, I can do that. That's cool. Um, and then, you know, we've done really, really well with e SEO in Drupal for a long time. And um, it's, you know, we've had good structured data for a long time, and that's, it's, been, it's been a good selling point. Um, we use the semantic information uh, defined on schema.org to structure our data. Um, and schema.org is this huge, like I geeked out on this um, it, uh, 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 one day, um, it's this huge collection of, of every way that you could describe so many different things like a museum and what kind of exhibition it has or what kind of hamburgers a restaurant has or, you know, on and on and on. There's these, these ways to mark up this data um, so that it's exactly clear what it is. And I don't think it's really readable here, but this is a web search that says restaurants in Bicocca, where we are today. Um, and then um, I can see several places around around here, around the venue, and they have an average rating. They have what kind of food it's serving. They have the address. They have the opening hours. They have a telephone number. They maybe have a photo of all these places. And, you know, Google and Bing and Yahoo and whoever else don't have, um, I have to tell this to people, they don't have armies of typing monkeys copying down, you know, looking through phone directories or going to your website to copy all this stuff down. Google can find this if your website presents it in a way that Google understands out of the gate. So if you have any kind of a physical business, right, any kind of a business that relies on being found in Google, which is pretty much every kind of business today, Google can construct these lists if you have a well-structured website. Oh, did I mention that Drupal 8? That's our whole game. So hand in hand with accessibility, schema.org, structured data gives us enormous findability for free. Simply by choosing to use Drupal 8, we can offer this value to all of our end customers, anybody who cares about people finding them. The last point um, is value for 
all of us, and I think all of us as developers and as business people, and semantic versioning s s is seemingly dry and academic, but um, you know, we have this new governance model and we've delivered on it. We've promised that every six months we're going to update Drupal. Between Drupal 7.0 coming out and uh, whatever version, what version of Drupal 7 are we on today? Okay. You know, there haven't been significant new features to added to core, right? If I had a great idea, if you had an amazing idea that could, go into, could have gone into Drupal 7 and you had it, you know, the day after a feature freeze, well, I hope you got it into Drupal 8, Right, but maybe you didn't, and maybe you've already left the project. Um, now we have every six months we have a minor point release. We have 8.1 now, 8.2 in September, 8.3 in April 2017, and with each point release, we're allowed to add new features and new functionality as long as we don't break API compatibility along the way. So all of a sudden, we have innovation within our major release. Right? So within Drupal 8.1, for example, the, the CK editor got some more buttons. It got a language and a spelling button. Um, and as a developer, right, if I have a great idea, I can see it realized in the system in six months, in a year. This is a huge motivator for, to keep people contributing, to get more people to help us and give them the satisfaction of really making a difference now in the cycle. Um, along the way, we still do, you know, um, we still do security releases and have you in the third point, so 8.1 point whatever, are, are, you know, bug fixes and security updates. So, for example, in Drupal 8.1, we have shown anyone who might have doubted us when we made this promise, like we're shown that we're delivering on this promise, and we're showing everyone that when you choose Drupal, starting with Drupal 8, you're choosing a community and a technology that is growing and evolving and it's going to keep pace with what's going on the web now. So in Drupal 8.1, um, we got Big Pipe and the migration modules moved into core as experimental modules. We got the language and spelling buttons in CK Editor. We got support for automated Java te script testing, which is amazing. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, it's funny because in the beginning of Drupal 8, when, when it was just conceived, everybody was really, really nuts about the tour module, and um, somehow nobody ever thinks about it anymore, and I'm not sure what it is, but um, another change in Drupal 8.1 is that the core tours are now displayed on the admin help page. <laughs> and um, Drupal 8.2 is around the corner, and um, we're going to be seeing more fun stuff there around Composer and, and what have you. So um, then I like to show people this graph of how the um, semantic versioning system works, where we basically have minor point releases until the day comes when there's a piece of innovation that we cannot make API compatible with what we've been doing so far. And at that moment, when the core team decides we absolutely want to do this thing and we can't do it without breaking compatibility, then we're going to cut Drupal 9 and we're going to start working. Um, I've been hanging out a little bit even with the Typo 3. Community Typo 3 is a very, very strong CMS in Germany. Um, I hate to admit it, but I will say in public that Typo 3 CMS 7 is incredible and we could, we have a lot, we could learn a lot from um, how they're doing a bunch of things. They, they're very, very strongly German-centric, however, they're not really adopted very much outside of Germany. Um, but they've got incredibly smooth and easy upgrades. And every time we go from a Drupal 5 to 6 and 7 to 8 and so on and make it huge and difficult and painful and expensive, we lose business and we lose clients and we lose the opportunity to contribute and come together and sprint and have fun and hang out with our friends and do the part of Drupal that we care about on the geek side, right? Because we have to do the selling side as well. Every time we make an inflection point, which makes it possible for someone to go and ch have a good reason to choose another system, right? Instead of going through another god-awful Drupal upgrade, um, you know, we're not helping ourselves. And the one um, shining vision, um, the thing that I'm most excited about in the semantic versioning system is we can make the Drupal 9 upgrade simply let's take everything in Drupal 8 that still works, put in this new piece of API, and then you have 
potentially, you know, a double API that's called the 8.9 API, and then in 9 point, pick a date, drop support for the 8 stuff, keep everything going, and we can make upgrades, even through major versions, um, quick and easy and relatively safe. Um, I am neither qualified, I am not, not qualified in any way to make that happen, I apologize, um, but I, I think that it would be uh, hu hugely beneficial to all of us. Um, in any case, we have a system now that's incredib incredibly relevant for the devices and the technologies and the verticals that we want to sell into. We have a system that is doing what PHP does now and today, and PHP is still the language that runs more than 80% of the internet. We've won huge amounts of friends and admiration out in the PHP communities. If you haven't engaged with them, go meet those people. They're super cool. And we have a system that's fun to work with. It's fun to work with in the back end. It's fun, it's exciting. And I believe with the architecture and with this conceptual model for development, we also have the chance to simply stay relevant and interesting and exciting again for the next five years for sure, for the next 10 years. So thank you all of you who've contributed to that. Thank you for inviting me here today. And thank you um, also for letting me be your advocate out in the broader world. This is open source. This stuff comes from all sorts of other people as well. I automatically and completely thank and acknowledge all of their contributions. If you could fill out my one form, here is the QR code for that. I will be here for the whole event. Please come and talk with me. Um, thanks again.